Hey, Happy Friday. This week, China got a brand new flagship chip for Android smartphones. Johnny Ive and Sam Altman announced some really weird things, and Google got really serious about desktop mode. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. <music> This video was sponsored by Sadie. Okay, for my first story of the week, Xiaomi launched their latest flagship called the Xiaomi 15S Pro, and it will have the company's very first self-developed flagship chip called the X-Ring 01. Xiaomi designed the chip, it was fabbed by TSMC on its 3 nanometer 3NE process, and as it turns out, it's a proper competitor to the Snapdragon and MediaTek flagships. Geeker One has made a whole 21 minute deep dive in Chinese about its performance, which I've linked to down below, and he basically says that the CPU performance across various benchmarks puts it head to head with the competition, while the GPU is a little bit weaker, putting it between the current generation and the last, but still ahead of an Apple 18 for example. Since this is Xiaomi's first ever flagship chip, I'd say that is basically remarkable, especially when you consider that Google, for example, has been struggling to get anywhere near this level for multiple generations now. If you're a chip nerd, the quick details are that there are 10 CPU cores in a pretty fun 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 2 setup, while for the GPU it uses the same ARM Immortalis G925 as the flagship MediaTek Dimensity 9400, just with a different core configuration. Beside these, Xiaomi also used its own in-house designed 4th generation image signal processor and NPU as well. And the only real downside to the chip is that Geeker One found that Xiaomi had to use an external modem from MediaTek, which is not exactly great for power efficiency. And therefore you get slightly worse battery life with the Xiaomi chip than you would with the Snapdragon one. But hey, Xiaomi also recently announced the X-Ring T1 in a watch of theirs, which is actually a wireless modem, although only a 4G one. So clearly Xiaomi is working on this already, but 5G modems seem to be a real stumbling block for many companies. Still a pretty amazing achievement overall, I'd say. Okay, for my second story of the week, Sam Altman and Johnny Ive would like to introduce I.O. to you. And no, this is not an elaborate prank, this is their actual announcement photo, and I don't understand why. Why is it so weird? Why does he smile in such a creepy way? Anyway, OpenAI is spending a not ridiculous $6.5 billion to acquire the artificial intelligence startup of Johnny Ive, who left Apple in 2019, to start his own company called Loveform, and then they made a new company, which OpenAI already bought 23% of late last year. Sam Altman then said that OpenAI was going to create a product at a level of quality that, quote, has never happened before in consumer hardware, okay, and then in the video, he said the following. Johnny recently gave me one of the prototypes that the device for the first time to take home and I've been able to live with it, and I think it is the coolest piece of technology that the world will have ever seen. Those are some very big words. I'm sadly also getting some echoes of the humane AI pin all over this, which Sam was apparently also fond of, so uh, I'm not exactly confident. Anyway, in a leaked recording, Sam also told staff that OpenAI aims to eventually ship 100 million AI companion devices with the goal of releasing a device by late 2026. So what kind of a device exactly? Ming-Chi Kuo said that it will be larger than a humane AI pin, and yet it may connect to smartphones and PCs to use their computing power and display capabilities, and also that it may be worn around the neck. And then another report said that it will be capable of being fully aware of a user's surrounding and life, it will be unobtrusive, able to rest in one's pocket or on one's desk, and will be a third core device a person would put on a desk after a MacBook Pro and an iPhone. Side note, I always love that for so many Apple people, concepts like a laptop or a smartphone generally don't exist, it's always a MacBook and an iPhone, nothing else. Anyway, Johnny Ive's team will also take over all design over at OpenAI, including software. And one of the funny things is that Apple's stock actually dropped as much as 2.3% when the deal was announced on Wednesday. I have some very strong doubts that the likes of Apple, Google, and Meta, who already have all of your existing context and all of your existing ecosystems, will not just be able to win this race by default. But, you know, I'd love to be proven wrong. And talking of Google, my third story of the week is something that I think went completely under the radar at I.O. Specifically, Google not only gave the long-awaited desktop mode on Android a sneak preview, but they also explicitly said that Android 16's new desktop mode builds on the foundation of Samsung DeX. And reading into this, it seems like Google is basically taking Samsung DeX's code and they're adopting that to the rest of the Android ecosystem rather than developing stuff from scratch. That is good because functionally DeX is really nice and it also means that we'll have a unified solution. And you might remember that Google and Samsung also recently merged QuickShare and I think it was called Nearby Share into one solution, so there is a precedent here too. What's more, Google is generally pushing Android 16 apps to adapt well to large screens not just for the desktop mode, but also for Android Automotive and Android XR, where all of those apps will automatically work if they're made to be adaptive for large screens. And Google says that there are combined 500 million large screen devices running Android apps, which is honestly way more than I thought there were. 
this recent push for desktop mode makes a lot of sense to me now that I think about it through the lens of Android XR coming to the market soon, but as a foldable user, I'm just happy we're getting more support for better big screen apps. And moving on to our release monitor, we start with the Huawei MateBook Fold, which launched this week as a foldable laptop tablet hybrid with either a virtual or optionally a physically attachable keyboard. I got this footage from Leszek Lesnar, whose full hands-on video I've linked to down below, and what's impressive is not only the super slim hardware, but also that it runs Huawei's own Android-free Harmony OS Next, including a full desktop mode. Looks pretty nice to be honest, though it's also China only for now, and it costs a whopping $3,300, so it's an extremely niche thing for now. And also this week, Dyson announced a ridiculously skinny battery-powered vacuum that they called the Pencil Vac that is literally just a stick, which is a tiny little motor in it and also a pretty fun-looking swappable battery system, plus also something called fluffy cones, which have these conical shapes so that hair just rolls off them, and then they also have fluffy edges so that you can rub them right against the wall for cleaning. Clever. Moving on, Razer announced the Blade 14, which is an AMD-powered laptop with NVIDIA 50 series GPUs and OLED for a pretty cool $2,300. And MSI, meanwhile, announced the Claw A8 handheld with the new AMD Ryzen Z2 Extreme chip that should be more powerful, I guess. Not bad. And moving on to the brief, Philips has just announced a new program that lets you 3D print parts at home that might have broken. They give you the designs and optimal settings and everything, and that's pretty cool. Though so far there's really only a new comb for a razor, so I'll only celebrate once we go a little bit further. Then, in perhaps side news, Mozilla has announced that they'll shut down Pocket on the 8th of July to focus on what's next. I still don't fully understand why Mozilla bought it in the first place, but I guess the Mozilla graveyard grows even bigger. Moving on, BYD has apparently now sold more electric vehicles in Europe than Tesla for the first time ever in April this year. Now, that is only by a hair and only one month for now, but yikes, Tesla, it seems like you're losing the second really huge market after China to BYD. In the more car news, Brembo has announced new brakes that they say will cut the brake dust emissions by 90% in a high-volume product. Pretty cool if true. And going back to Google, they of course announced a ton of different things at I.O. beyond just desktop mode, starting with Gemini being rolled out into Gmail to basically write emails on your behalf with your own tone and your context if you let it crawl through your entire digital life. Plus, Gemini is also coming to Chrome, at least in the US for now, where it will essentially be able to navigate and even click through websites on your behalf eventually. And interestingly, Google also announced a new AI Ultra plan for $250 per month for those who want the maximum AI from Google. And finally, for I.O., Google also talked about Android XR. For smart glasses, they actually did a proper live demo on stage, which gives me at least a little bit of confidence in their timelines. And then they also officially partnered with Gentle Monster and Warby Parker, both of which are really popular brands. Though weirdly enough, the first pair of Android XR-enabled glasses will be made by Xreal under the name Project Aura. And anyway, moving on from Google, Intel at Computex demoed its much-awaited next-generation Panther Lake CPUs built on the all-important 18A node. And that is great for Intel, though apparently we will have to wait until it arrives to devices in early 2026. Now, fun fact, Intel actually invited me to go to their Computex thing over in Taiwan, which I sadly couldn't go to due to a couple of things getting in the way. But if I had gone, though, the first thing that I would have done before even arriving to Taiwan would have been to get an eSIM from Sealy. I've already used Sealy eSIMs everywhere from mainland China to Malaysia to Thailand, and I basically never want to travel without one again. You can just download the app, pay a few bucks, and have an eSIM with a mobile internet connection in over 180 countries. There's no need to re-download the app as you switch countries either. In Taiwan for Computex, that would have cost me $3.99 for a base package, while in some other countries like Thailand, for example, things are even cheaper starting at just $2.99. Oh, and better yet, if you use my code TFC at checkout, you can even get a 15% off of those already very affordable prices. I love the convenience of buying an eSIM from home before I even go traveling, so I never have to hunt for a physical SIM at the airport or bother with dodgy airport Wi-Fis or anything. And all of this just feels like such a 21st century experience. The vast majority of current iPhone and Android devices support eSIMs, and if you run into some issue, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee anyway. All you need to do is download the app with my link saily.com slash tfc, which is also linked down in the description, and then you book your plan with my code tfc to be sure that you get 15% off your order. Links are in the description, and happy travels!